Hi, and welcome to Soul Care Podcast. We are so glad you're here with us today. I'm Kimberly Willis. And I am Jinda Reinick. We are joined by our soul care expert, Warren Lamb. Hi, glad to be here. We are here to talk about soul care, what it means, what it looks like, and the hope it can offer. Our desire with this podcast is to offer hope for battling some of the greatest struggles we face as humans, and to do so with love, kindness, grace, and prayer. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for this journey into the world of biblical soul care. Let's get started. So talking about anxiety disorders, when you take a look at the DSM-5, it says that fear is an emotional response to real or perceived imminent threat, whereas anxiety is anticipation of future threat. Think about that. Anticipation. That is a, that's something that goes on with a mind, with a, with a belief system. It has nothing to do with the brain. The brain is going to respond to that belief. If that's the case, why are we attacking the brain with neurotoxins to get it to stop trying to process through that fear, that sense of fearfulness? Yeah. And that's a good point because a lot of times when we talk about, well, uh, not to derail the topic, but when we talk about anxiety or depression, it, people will go to, oh, it's it's a wiring thing or, you know, you're depressed because of levels, your levels being off and, you know, you just need to get on the right medication. But even that definition suggests to your point, it's, it's not just that, right. It's, it's the connection right. between that and, and the soul and, and what you believe to be true and what you have. Yeah. Your body are going to respond to what your heart believes. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. Yeah. But if we don't believe that there's an immaterial aspect to our makeup that drives these things, then we are going to have to say it's all organic. Yeah. If we only see material, materialism, then there is no immaterial. So there really isn't a soul. There is not a mind. Those are just, you know, aspects of the chemical processes. Those are those are the byproducts of that. Right. I think anxiety is talk about how does someone get to you with this quote unquote diagnosis when it comes to either anxiety disorder um, or uh, just, you know, when they have a lot of anxiety and it's actually pretty common. I feel like this, this just anxiety in general. I know a lot of it even came post the pandemic or through the pandemic because for a myriad of different reasons, it was either the fear of getting sick, the fear of losing a loved one, the fear of work, you know, the isolation. I mean, it was rampant. So I would venture to guess that when someone reaches you and they just are wound so tight with anxiety and they struggle with it, there's probably not, it comes from all walks of life. Yeah. Is what I'm trying to get. Yeah. But I've I've sat with, you know, I've sat with people who sit sit across from me hyperventilating. You know, I've, I've had counselees who, as soon as they wake real, wake up in the morning and realize that they're awake, they start hyperventilating because they're so anxious about the day. When we when we dial that all back and get right down underneath all of that, anxiety is a, a, a fearfulness that everything is going to be out of control and, and they're not going to survive it. That's what I, that, that kind of fearfulness. Mm-hmm. Well... What that really means is you you have no confidence that God really is in control. Mm-hmm. Either he isn't, can't be, or he won't be. Yeah. He may be in control for other people, but he's not in control for me. That's the thing, though, is if God's not in control of all of this, I'm going to have to be, but I know I can't be. Well, if that doesn't create anxiety, and nothing. So that- Nobody's in charge. Yeah, that. It's interesting because it's such a common theme of other conversations that we've had about, you know, um, uh, modernisms and and talking about how you have the answer within. Well, that's a prime example of why anxiety lives, um, lives and plays host in so many people is because you don't you if you believe in God and if you believe it, you know, he is uh, in control, but you don't really live that out. 
then you know that you need to take control, but you know that you can't really control everything. So it's like this cycle, right? It's you're, you're stuck on that, that loop of thinking. Well, and then that, that will end up a person says, okay, I'm going to invest all the control I possibly can and the things that I can control. And that develops into what the world calls OCD. Mm-hmm. That's about um, intense control over minutia. Yeah. Thing is, is that am I really in control? Am I really in control? There's really this un- underlying doubt. Yeah. You know, somebody has to wash their hands 52 times, or they have to tap the floor three times before they turn the doorknob, or they have to open and close and open and close, open and close. It's getting these rituals set in because of that fearfulness. I have control. I've got control. See, I've got control here. But I know people that have been so debilitated by what is called OCD, they can't even leave the house. Yeah. Because of all the potentialities and all the rituals that go in with each step of the way. So so if we take a step back and so we say when someone someone comes into you and is dealing with anxiety, and that can manifest in many different ways, just like what the example, it could go to an extreme of OCD, or it can literally just be mentally a fearfulness, right? Just a, a nervous fearfulness that you can, that sleeps keeps you up at night that impedes your 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 diet or your ability to socialize all you so many extremes right when it comes to the spectrum of anxiety and anxiety disorder. Yeah, think of piglet and winnie the pooh that's anxiety yeah right yeah piglet's anxiety has anxiety <laughs> so for people that, that struggle with this mm-hmm. um and someone who's at an ex- let's say an um, an extreme to start with someone who has become the person who like you said is hyperventilating just sitting down to talk with you what is that T- talk us through that process of of identifying kind of what's happened in their life that you know you say that it's a lack of control or maybe they they feel like god isn't in control is that usually because they've seen god not be in control or they've been victim of things when they were had no control yeah, usually it goes back to when they didn't have control, they were powerless, somebody else was in control, bad things happened to them, so they have to be in control to keep make sure that bad things don't happen to them. And it's not in even necessarily a logically thought out progression, not a conscious path, path <clears throat> but that's underneath it. Mm-hmm. So the thing is, is the thing that they're saturating on is, I have to be in control, I have to be in control, I have to be in control. That's what they're saturating on. We have to change what they're saturating in their mind and their heart with. It really is that simple. It's that foundational. Because when we change what that person is saturating on, we change what they believe. So we change the path of their life. The trajectory that they're on changes. Like the one gal I was talking about, she sat on my my sofa in the early part of February hyperventilating. I mean, it was all her sister could do was to get her out of the house, to get in the car, to come to me. And she started talking about this. I said, okay, well, so let's talk about what's going to happen. What really is going to happen when you walk out that door and walk across the street to get your mail out of the mailbox? Let's talk about everything that could possibly happen. And she named something. I said, okay, how likely is that? Well, not very. Okay, so let's set that, that one aside. What's next? So we went through a list of like, I don't know, 75, 80 things. And continually going through, okay, how likely is that? And as the list grew, it got less and less and less likely. So it got further and further and further from the reality that she lived in. I said, I would be anxious too if I was looking at all of those possibilities, not knowing whether any of them actually would, knowing that most of them probably couldn't, but I still don't know. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with that? And that's what I asked her. I said, so what do we do with that? She goes, I don't know. I said, that's the point. You don't know. None of us knows other than God. God knows. Let's think about the last time you were so anxious ridden, you couldn't even get out of bed. How bad did that day go? What things went wrong that day? Oh, I can't, I can't even remember. Well, if they were significant things, you think you might remember, right? Because there would have been an emotional impact of that. Yeah. Remember best what we're most emotionally connected to. Yeah, I really can't remember. Okay, so what that means is that your forecast for the day proved false. Okay. Okay. What about what about another time? 
so we actually helped her recognize that she was prophesying a future that never happened. Mm. And that's when I came up with a word picture. You're running around trying to put out fires that haven't even been lit. So do the, so when you go through that list of all these potentialities and, and you start to narrow down on that, you know, there's such a small percentage of chance that all those potentialities can actually happen. Are they, is typically like in her example, is she aware that logically the reality of that becoming uh, or of that happening is low, but she's so transfixed on the sheer magnitude of potentialities, the logic is set to the side because the emotional. Yeah, she kind of brushes up against logic, but remember, emotions are much more powerful than truth. Right. And that's what she was getting caught up in is the emotion, yeah. the intense emotions that she was experiencing. Right. Yeah. So I said, okay, let's say that this happened. Let's say that that actually happened. How bad would that have been? What, what do you think the outcome of that really would have been? Well, as we started walking through that, it was like, well, even if that had happened, it wouldn't have been as catastrophic. Okay. So then I just shifted. I said, so where did you learn about life being catastrophic? I, I don't know. I don't know. So we, I said, well, let's think about the first catastrophe in your life that you can remember. Okay. So then we started talking about that catastrophe. What was catastrophic about that? Because you'll notice that people who struggle with anxiety will catastrophize things. They use big language. Oh, it was devastating. I just feel trapped. Like there's no escape. You know, I mean, it's like the worst of the worst of the worst. They use catastrophizing language. Mm -hmm. But when we look at it, how catastrophic was that? So did you die when that happened? Well, well, no. Of course not, because you're sitting here. So what what did happen? What or how bad did it really get? Okay. And then we start able to see that <clears throat> it, it comes down to number one, I don't really believe that God is in control or will be in control. Number two, I know I can't be. But number three is I'm actually entitled to a stress-free, safe, perfectly safe life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's not reality. That's not reality. It's not the world we live in. Right. And so I have expectations that I have to manage my life so that this unreasonable expectation can be met. That's a whole lot of weight for me and to carry a whole lot of responsibility mm -hmm. for me to have to take to, to manage. That's an interesting take because I would have never gotten there to think that someone it would turn into a form of um, like entitlement about how life should go or how what they deserve to, to happen. Right. Well, remember they're overlaying horrible things that happened in the past when they didn't have control and they were powerless, yeah. assuming that that same level of catastrophe is going to happen in absolutely every case where things go wrong. Yeah. Things are going to go wrong. You missed that that light turned red before you got there. <gasps> catastrophe. Yeah. Right. That's the way it feels. It feels like a catastrophe, even though it Every, isn't. Everything is like a mega event, even though it's it's just a reality of life. You know. <laughs> I mean, you could even flip it by saying, "Well, maybe." I don't know. This is probably too far of a stretch. Now that I'm saying it out loud, but well, maybe there's a reason you missed that red light. You know, maybe or you, you, like it's it's all in perspective at the end of the day. And not that we want to, you know, super make everything super spiritual, but um, it's just it, you could do either side. You know, you could see everything as oh, what a blessing! I get more time to sit here and listen to my favorite song, or or you take it as oh my gosh, this is like this. I'm going to be so late, or the, it, all of I mean, it, again, it's all the perspective and it's all of. What we're, we're either saturating on the good and and the positive, or we're saturating on the negative and the horrible, and either perspective can be an extreme. The the number one problem is we're completely disconnected from what's real and true. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to start learning to get to. Yeah. But underlying all of that was, and I see this a lot, 
that person is not able to believe that God really cares about them and cares for them because the things that have happened in the past seemed like God didn't care. Right. Like God wasn't there. He wasn't paying attention. He missed it or just didn't like them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that sense that I don't matter to God, it's not even that Matt, God isn't in control or can't be. It's that I don't matter enough to God for him to manage this for me. So now we're back to that. It's about me. It's my fault somehow. Yeah. So how do you navigate someone through that, um, that kind of brokenness? Because let's say that you have been victim of things as a child and you were, you had no control, right? I think about it in, in completely different scenarios. So I, this is not to put myself on the same page as someone who has experienced trauma at a young age, um, the thought process sometimes for me, though, will be, I know you can intercede right now, God, and you're not. And I just don't understand. You're so powerful and you're so incredible. Right. Why do I have to keep experiencing uh -huh. X fill in the blank, you know, and it can be so different. And so that so I can understand how someone can take an, an, an event or a pattern of events or childhood. And because they were not protected through that childhood by God, they now think God has forsaken them and that he doesn't care that they're not valuable enough. So how do you take them through that? Because that's pretty heavy, right? I mean, that's a reality a lot of people. To, but it comes back to our basic things. So the first thing is identity in Christ. Okay. I, I had this conversation with a fellow today, very first conversation that we had. And he's carrying a lot of toxic shame, all this stuff from his childhood. And the underlying sense that he doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. So I, I, I said, okay, but let's take a look at this. Again, outside of creation, no, nothing exists. No time, no space, no matter, no universe, no nothing. Only God. God who's transcendent mind, which is immaterial was fully aware of every possible universe that he could create out of an infinite number and variety of universes, an infinite number and variety of people he could create, infinite number and variety of circumstances, infinite number and variety of choices. And in his godness, his grace, his mercy, his love, his providence, all of that, he knew which of those possible universes would accomplish his optimum best will. And that's the universe he created, which is this one that you exist in. Someone who's like, okay, that sounds great. But really, that's the world where I was abused as a child. Like, that's the best he could do. Hang on. So I'm going to answer that. Kimberly's joined us. Yay. Hi. Hi. Yay. <laughs> so that question comes up a lot. And it, we're, we're, we're approaching the problem from the wrong angle with that question. It's rooted in why would God? Why would God do this? That's because in our limited understanding, we have an idea of how God is supposed to be or should have been. But that's based on what I, how I think I would do, do the God job. Right? right. It's like understanding that your child cannot understand why you allow things or don't stop things from happening in their life that they hate, that they don't like, right? Why would you do that? For them, it's a huge deal in the moment, right? And maybe even later. But for you, what do you understand? You understand that this, this is important. It's going to be important down the road for this child to experience this and be able to work through it, like somebody being mean to them, right? Helping them navigate through that, helping them learn to stand up to bullies, helping them learn to not take to heart somebody Ill insulting them or calling them names. Yeah, you could have stopped it, but to what end? Because when they are not in your home, they're going to be faced with that in all kinds of places all through the rest of their life. and. I mean, some of the people are going to be even meaner than the people they know right now. 
they can't understand why you would let that happen. But there's a there's an there's a greater purpose that's going to be served for them. Right? We take a look at the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Right toward the end of the story, he makes a very profound statement to his brothers. You intended evil against me, but God meant it for good. God knew exactly what you were going to do. First, you were going to want to kill me. And he said, no, we can make a buck. Let's sell him. So I went from being an enemy to be killed to a thing to be sold, completely dehumanizing. And then I end up in Egypt. And then I end up being lied about, falsely accused, end up in prison. All this stuff happens. And Joseph said, and God intended it for good so that many would be saved, you and your little ones, right? So he said, God basically sent me ahead to Egypt to prepare this place for you and your our extended family to one day be, right? That seems cruel. Well, what standard are you using for cruel, yeah. right? So we don't understand. I, I tell people, I look back at my life, and I had a lot of times when I did what I call my L Lieutenant Dan moments, where I'm in the rigging of the shrimp boat screaming at God, is that the best you got? I think, well, what is wrong with you? Why did you let all those things happen to that little kid? But when I take a look at the healing that, that God brought me through that, the healing that he's brought to my life, and how he uses me in the lives of other people, it look back at it and it does make sense for me to have experienced those. Not everybody, not everybody experiences those things, but my life, it makes sense. It makes sense now. It didn't make sense then. Well, right? it almost goes back to what we talked about just a second ago about it's imperative to switch what you saturate on. Because if you take all those events and saturate on a lack of your worth and that God has no plan and you have no value, then you're right. You, you, you're be, it'll be very difficult to turn that into a way that God can use you as an instrument. If you shift your life and focus like you have and got freedom from that bondage, you're able to do God's ministry and he's able to use you in mighty ways. But again, it's because you've you've taken the, the 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 lens that you viewed those events through and put them in a perspective of your worth and god at, or through god which is i also think it's um so great in the the story of joseph how when he finally sees his brothers he's it like clicks and there's emotion it's like overwhelmingly emotional uh, just clarity of why it all happened he doesn't carry around this resentfulness he doesn't carry around bitterness he sees god's plan completely laid, laid out and it's like he just finds it to be so it's just beautiful well the thing is he's not he's not smooth sailing for him emotionally through the whole thing He's got some rocky patches. He's just, you know, it's like when, you know, he's in the prison and the butcher and the, you know, the, the baker, they get, you know, they're one dies, the other one lives and he forgets two years, two more years. He's in the prison. He's in the dungeon. Right. Yeah. It's like, why am I forgotten again? Right. Yeah. That's a normal question. It's not a matter of not feeling those things, not, not thinking those things, but it's a matter of saying, I am not going to stay bogged down in those things. Right. Okay. I don't have to, 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 and Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane is the perfect picture. Jesus is like, he's telling his heavenly father, this is really a bad idea. I don't want to do this. If there's any other option, let's, let's go with that. Right. He was, he was so, he was experiencing so much angst over that. He was sweating blood. But he kept shifting his thoughts back, his heart back to who is his heavenly father? Who is God the father? Continuing to come back, shifting his focus and his trust on that. I know that even though this is going to be the worst thing any human being could ever experience, 
you are going to bring me through it and I'm going to trust you and I'm going to go with this plan. Exactly. I think um, if the antidote in a sense when I'm thinking about anxiety is it's learning to trust. It's it not trading on um, and that goes back to kind of what Jenda was saying about like when you change your viewpoint of like that God made you with worth and value and if you trust and believe that you can trust God in your circumstance. And I think what happens with anxiety is um, I think, you know, going back to if you grew up with a lot of trauma, um, not learning to trust yourself and um, the guidance that God gives you and learning how to repair that. Right. Right. Well, and of course, you look back and at the time, this didn't feel like a learning experience that God was going to be. This is horrible. I'm terrified. I'm in a great deal of pain. I don't even know if I'm going to survive this. Those are very real, legitimate emotions to feel at the time. The thing is, is that when we're now we're years down the road and those things are not happening anymore, and we still continue to look back at that and we accuse God of, of moral failure in our past. We're actually sitting as God's judge saying, you blew it. Yeah. And I'm going to continue to accuse you of blowing it because I think you're going to continue to blow it. We don't realize that that's what's going on, but that is what's going on. Instead of saying, why, God, say, what now, God? Okay. Right. What now? What do we do now? Right. Mm -hmm. What do we do? What do I do with this? How do I, how do I navigate through this? Help me to trust you through this. Because that's another thing we talk about a lot. I think of the story of Noah and his family in the flood, right? The entire world's going to be wiped out. They're sealed up in this box. They can't see anything that's happening. Well, the word that's used for rain there, we only see two other times in Scripture, and it's for the kind of rain that's like hail on steroids. It tears mortised city walls apart. They're hearing this drum on the outside. Hour after hour after day after day after for 40 days, they hear this. They have no idea what's going on. They can't see it. They can't control it. They've got to trust God. You know they're anxious in there. But here's the thing. God brought them through the flood, and he protected them through the flood, and he delivered them to the other side of the flood, right? That's what we need to help. We need to learn and we need to help other people. Yes, garbage is going to happen. Horrible things happen in this life. Okay. <clears throat> and yes, sometimes people die in that process. But that's not always the case. It's not even normally the case. You didn't die in that process. You came through that. Now right. what? Now what are you going to do with that? What you, this, is, this is something you get to decide what you're going to do with this now. You want to be in control? Be in control of this. Yeah. You brought up something before that I think we should unpackage a little bit more, which is toxic shame, because we also carry around the shame of someone else's sins. And that, right, that, and that can be crippling. And that would also lead to this paradigm of how we see ourselves and our worth and value. Can you unpackage toxic shame just a little bit more? Toxic shame is about who I am, not about what I've done or what I've ha what's happened to me, but who I am. So this person horribly maltreated me because of me. I should have, powerful word, shaming word, I should have been or done or said something different in order to keep this from happening. This is in, in the final analysis, it's my fault somehow. Right. No, this this person made an evil choice to do evil things to a child or to their wife or to their whoever, right? They made a, a, a choice to do something horrible. And the thing is, it's not, it really would, wouldn't matter who it was, you or anybody else, whoever happened to be there, they would have targeted. It wasn't just because it was you, right? And then it's like, well, wasn't I worth saving? Okay. You were preserved through that. You are here. You are here now. Right. You were preserved yeah. through that. And it's interesting because that's just making me think about what you talked about before about this, this um, 
assumption that we should, we're entitled to a life without pain or without grief and with all this heartache. Um, and that really was not promised after the fall. After the fall, well, the sin was. entered. I feel like I, I, I feel like I get that all the time. Oh, you don't know your life has been so easy. You don't know anything about my life. My life maybe has been easier than others, but I've had my fair share of, of trauma and heartbreak and all this stuff. But I choose to not let it label my identity. I choose to rise above it. I've sought help, you know, even, you know, being with you and counseling. I mean, and that's not, again, I'm not trying to compare myself to other people and, uh, and whatever someone's going through right now is all is real and authentic. And we were, you know, they need, yeah. But I just think it goes to this whole, it's, it, it's like almost like a fallacy that, that we are supposed to have a life that, that everyone has, you know, you, and I don't want to extrapolate into a whole nother avenue here, but it's easy to look into someone else's life on their nine squares or their squares on Instagram or on Facebook and think they don't know what I'm experiencing. My pain is different. My trauma is different. I've overcome, or I'm in the midst of so much more. I want that life. And it, it can be overwhelming and anxiety ridden to not have the life you think other people have. But if we were all real and authentic, we all have something. We all are well, living in yeah. a world with, with broken, a brokenness. We bow down at what I call the idol of comparison. Mm. And it, it comes down to God should have done this differently. That's what jealousy and envy are about. God, you blew this. What they have, I should have. They shouldn't have that. I should have it instead. Or I should have what they have too. Right? You should in God. Yeah. There's no hope in that. Because there is there is no greater authority, higher authority other than God. So if we do not believe that God is good, very the very first thing, if we don't believe that God is good, then everything else is terrifying. And that's the, usually the thing that's missing, is God's goodness. Right. But I also think that's a fallacy when if you're, you are caught up in comparing, you're thinking something on the outside is what's going to make your life better and happier. And it's not, it's, then it, it's got to go rooted back to what's inside and your relationship with God, God and um, finding him to help you process through um, trauma, healing, and then processing through now you have these tools like, oh, okay, if I am disappointed, I have to trust God that he has a greater plan, that my character is being built here. Something, you know, um, something good good is coming from it. And it's not these um, external things of a vacation or a home or... Uh, well, people in the Christian community might think I'm being sacrilegious, but I think one of the most brilliant scenes movie scene that really helps us is um bruce almighty you know the movie bruce almighty um what's his name jim carrey all of a sudden he gets a chance to be god right Mm -hmm. and he just says yes to everybody's prayer and it creates nothing but a huge mess everywhere in the world right right i mean that was actually profound insight whoever wrote that in that was profound insight right it is because it's so great the analogy used before about, you know, oh, why, God, why would you do this when you go back to that parenting model? Like, OK, well, we say no to our children because we know better than them. We know they want to do certain actions, but we hold them back from doing it. We know what's best, you know, and and, and like a child, we might pro- they protest and they get mad and we do the same thing. But ultimately, when you look at the the big picture, we kept them safe. We kept them out of harm's way. We kept them in healthy environments, out of toxic friendship. I mean, that's the prime example. If we said yes to everything our kids wanted to do, they my son would be dead. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's now you just create- or even going back to the parenting model. Let's say, um, you know, maybe something where may- maybe another child was very mean, bully, abusive use inappropriate language and okay we couldn't protect in that moment but now when they're back with us we're going to give them tools to walk through that you know and and help them so then they're not they're walking through the process of that and they're not holding on to it right but the bottom line is 
a person doesn't understand what they're doing underneath is telling God, I would do a better job at being God than you're doing. Well, and I think, too, the thing with anxiety is, and I I had anxiety. Well, you know, that was the first thing you and I met about. Um, it, But it then it just became, it's almost like an awareness that I didn't have that my anxiety was rooted in a lack of actual faith that God was going to be there. I didn't even, I didn't even think of it like that at all. So that helps. I'm sorry. One of the things that helps those say, talk to me about something that was a, a horrible situation that you actually came through. Talk to me about that. Yeah. It's about having that balanced view of what is true. Yeah. Another thing, too, is, you know, we spend a lot of time asking, you said it, God, why, 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 versus, okay, what now? I can't change what happened to me. I can only change what happens moving forward, but I want to do it in a different way. I want it to honor you. I I want to be free from the bondage that has held me down. So what now? You know, it's we can get so caught up asking the wrong question. Why is he not answering my questions? Why is God not answering my prayers? I don't feel like I'm hearing from him. And then it's like, well, take a step back what are you asking him? Maybe those are not the right questions. Maybe you're asking him for something you're not ready for. Maybe you're asking him something he's never going to answer because that's not something you need to know. And we need to reframe what we're asking of God and be more open to what he wants to tell us. The country singer that did the song, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayer. God answers every prayer. No is an answer. But if you understand the premise, yeah, God said no to this. And he looks at it now and he says, man, I'm so glad God said. That's the thing is that that when, we, when we're able to look back in retrospect and, we, and we're, we're being honest, we're able to see that God did bring us through, that, that there, were situ- there were things going on at that time outside of that we were completely unaware of. That's because we're not omniscient. Only God is. Right. He's the only one that's all knowing. He knows all of those factors. We don't just like our children don't know everything that we know. Right. And so we're able to look back and say, man, you know, yeah, I can see God was at work. He brought me through. Things did not turn out horrible. Matter of fact, they turned out far better than I thought they would. How many times have you said that? That's that's not chance. Yeah. Chance is just a mathematical probability. Chance isn't even anything. Chance has no causal power, has no power to affect anything. It's not just chance. It's not karma. It's actually God. Yeah. It's funny today. I have a, a someone who works for me who's very much a, a worry or everything, worries about everything. And today he sends me this, this snapshot of someone or a, a, a staff. Um, Instagram that said about 85% of the 15% is pretty high odds, actually. <laughs> and I'm like, because 15% actually do happen. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I don't want to know what's the, what is, what's the source of that statistic? Because that's made up. Yeah, this is a uh, Instagram. But I just think I what I thought was more humorous besides the the statistics, which I, I don't know if that's accurate, is his perspective. Fifty percent is actually pretty pretty high odds. I'm like that is what fear does. That's what worry does, right? Like that that you're not even focused on. He's not even focused on eighty five percent are going to not happen. It's that fifteen percent. That what if that fifteen percent do happen? That can I'm, your entitled life. To, I'm entitled to a toilless and painless life. That's what I'm entitled to. And anything that doesn't cooperate with that is bad or wrong, evil, wicked, all of those things. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, you can't, there's no peace living in that place. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what's really interesting. I challenge people. I said, I, I say, you know, go on YouTube and find some of the testimonies of Corey Ten Boom, right? Um, she's passed away now, but uh, she and her family were helping Jews escape the Nazis, and they got caught, and they got sent to concentration camps. Well, she and her sister ended up in the same dorm, and she talks about being grateful for fleas. They had a flea infestation in their dorm, 
right? Horrible. Fleas, it's horrible. But the guards hated to go to their dorm because of the fleas, so they got left alone quite a bit. Right? So even in that, yeah, yeah, they got put into a concentration camp and all that stuff was bad. Sure, yes. But in spite of that, in spite of the evil of man, God was protecting them through that to the other side. And she survived. Her sister did not. The rest of her family did not. But her testimony about all that, how God carried them through and how her faith grew. Right. And so here's someone, had, had, if anybody has a right to be bitter and angry and, and wounded, it, it was her. I mean, she lost her entire family. But that's not what she walked away from that with. She had a tenderness and she had a, had a trust in God that, that is hard earned. She earned that. It developed in her. Right. So when people are anxious, it's like they really don't believe God's going to pull through for them. Mm. And really, a lot of times is they don't believe that they're worth it to God. So on one side, I'm entitled to not have to deal with this. And the other side is, I'm not worth it to God. That's why we keep coming back to identity in Christ. We have to come back to inherent worth. And do you, and there's another tool that you teach, right? Too, that um, sometimes that voice is the voice that you were raised with and that you, yeah. have to, you have to stop believing those lies and you have to come back to what God says. Yes. Yeah, and sometimes you have to say, you know, you shut up, quit hijacking my thoughts. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and you know, that we, what we always talk about or what we, what we, the, the three core things are our identity in Christ, the nature and character of God, right? And then confidence and the, in that. Yes. And so the, but the nature and character is I was just talking to someone about that in particular, where, you know, that voice again is the lies, the lies of what we believe to know of what we believe about ourselves that have flooded our brains for so long. Um, but we, we have to go back to the nature and character. It's not just about who we are in Christ. It's his nature and character. So it's pointing to the Bible. Okay. Well, show me in the Bible where it's the story of, of God forsaking one of his of his followers. We have to believe the nature and character of, of how he how he is and he's merc he's a good God. He's a merciful God. So it's it's just those the pillars, right? That's why we rest on those three pillar pillars because if you can't wrap your mind around your self-worth, that's the, the number one, but then it's also the the putting the context to your self-worth as well. And isn't it I think a tool that you like to use, Warren, is shifting your focus, right? Like, so you can start seeing how God actually does show up for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, what was, well, like, like your friend. Well, 15% is a pretty high number, right? Yeah. You can focus on that or you can shift your focus yeah. to, man, I'm glad it's only that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that goes back to even, um, people not knowing if they're hearing for, from God or not. And it's, it's, um, it's so small, right? His voice is so quiet that, you know, but let's take a look at the broader picture. Who is God really? That's why we continue to come back to those same basic things, you know, and understanding that <clears throat> when somebody experiences anxiety, their body and their brain cannot tell the difference between a real threat or an imagined threat. So they react. Right. Then you have this physiological response where the adrenaline and, you know, all that stuff gets pushed and uh, the muscles tense up to fight or flee. <clears throat> Oxytocin that gets released so that if you get injured, it'll help with pain management, all that stuff. Right. You're not really in any real danger but it feels like it it seems like it so your brain and your body are going to respond to that and even teaching people how to take control of what's going on with their body they don't need medication you need to change what you're thinking about how you're thinking about it. you can take control of what's going on with 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 your breathing with your body and you can actually stop the cascading effect of all those, those hormones 
So what yeah. type of breathing would you say? Like, is there, is there a specific technique? Yeah. Yeah, we call it box breathing, right? And it's, it's hard to get under control at first. So you have to really pay attention, which actually shifts your focus again. But it's taking a, uh, uh, taking a breath in for a four count, holding it for a four count, letting it out for a four count, holding it empty for a four count. It's just creating a box, right? And if, if, and if you can only do three, do three and build to four, right? But you want to get that pattern because it – but I also tell people when you take, take that breath in, close your mouth and breathe in through your nose because that oxygenates the blood. And oxygenated blood stops the release of cortisol, which is going to keep this whole thing trapped, Right. And that has a cascading effect, a tumbling effect to start to break up the whole physiological mess. Right. So we have to understand that the brain and the body and the mind and soul are synergistic wholes. What impacts one part of it impacts the others. So we're not going to ignore the brain and the body, but we're not going to medicate the brain and the body. We don't need medication. Because even the DSM 5 says this person believes that a potential threat is a real threat. That's not the brain. That is the mind. That's the heart. So we haven't talked about that yet, um, about how the, we read through the DSM, and then we've talked a lot about what would lead, what kind of is the symptomology, if you will, that leads someone to this um, battle that they're having. What... In the, if you will go to see a psychiatrist about this, what are they going to? We obviously soul care. You would not you recommend using anything except for the Bible, right? And um, are people on medications that you're typically trying to help them wean off of? There's there's lots of anti-anxiety medications that are being prescribed. We have to remember that these. Um, these medications are very aggressive antitoxins. So you've got Celexa, Cymbalta, Lexapro, Prozac, Lovox, Paxil, Soloft, uh, Effexor. You know, those are like some of the, the top ones. <clears throat> and they, again, they attack the brain. All right. And it, it, they, they work on the brain serotonin. You know what's really interesting about that? We talked about this last time. We talked about depression. There's no scientific evidence to support serotonin-based depression or anxiety. Right? There's no evidence to support those things. Just because these chemicals attack the brain and its ability to process those neurotransmitters doesn't mean that those neurotransmitters are the problem. Mm. It's like crimping off a hose. It doesn't stop the water from going through the hose. It just interrupts it for a while. There's still water in the hose. That's why you have to continue to take the medication again and again. And eventually the brain is going to fight back. The pressure is going to build up. So then you've got to change the medication, change the dosage, change the medication. That's and not what's needed. And what? do you find when um, people you've worked with, do they do taper off the medication, then all the feelings come out, right? Well, yeah, see, um, yeah, um, need to be able to experience what's actually happening so they can process through it, right? You have to be able to process through it. You have to be able to partner with God and hopefully another strong believer who can walk through it with you. So you're not alone. So it's in a way like God has provided these tools, breathing, going for a walk, changing our diet, relying on him, saturating on his word. They're all, they're all here, right? Yeah. It's all part yeah, of like what I is meant to survive. What was that? Yeah. I was just gonna say, I've, I've, I've almost like rear ended a car and I feel that same thing, you know, where my, I'm so like, all my nerves, everything is just like on and it I feel it so strongly that it's like oh my gosh I gotta shake it off I can like flash back to this it's it's real those yeah yeah absolutely 
No. Well, that's the thing. You didn't hit the other car, but you almost did. Yeah. Your brain and your body can't tell the difference because this is this is a threat. Is it is it, is it a full blown threat? Is it actual? It, it's a dangerous situation. We're we're created by God to react to danger in certain ways, yeah. but when there isn't a real danger, that we're actually using a, a survival system in a way that God never intended for it to be used. So we're turning it on too often. Well, we get habituated. We get habituated in that. Yeah, I, I, I've got all this adrenaline going and, you know, I'm, I'm in the survival mode. But now it's not something really, really scary. Now it's just something that's very tense, mm -hmm. making me very tense, very stressful. So that actually starts getting because, well, that potentially could get that bad. Right. And it is about me being able to be feel like I have to be in control of this so that the bad things don't happen. And it is harder for trauma survivors, but not all trauma survivors, because one thing we haven't talked enough about, and I, we think we need to talk about, we've talked about a little bit, but what we call resiliency factors, right? A person can go through a crisis and it not become trauma because of the resilience factor. So their ability to, to process through it, to navigate through it, to get to the other side of it, and everything gets dialed down. Those, so the word trauma comes from the Greek word trauma, which means wound. So they don't end up wounded in the process. Minor damage, but not an ongoing woundedness, right? And that's the difference. Because I've known people to go through just incredibly traumatizing events, but come out on the other side of it, not traumatized. Like, how did you, how did that not mess you up for the rest of your life? It's because of the, the foundation that they have. They felt love. they they really had a, a trust that God was with them through it, even though it was a bad situation. They knew they were going to be okay. They they uh, they handled it well. Uh, they handled it in a, you know in a godly way or whatever. So all these positives shift that away from being an ongoing woundedness to yeah, I I was injured, but I recovered and I'm fine. So, yeah, I think that isn't talked enough about because not everyone carries it forever. You know, that's that needs to be the hope too. That hey, maybe you're battling it and you're carrying it now, but if you get to the other side, you're resilient and it will it'll hurt, but you, you it doesn't control. It doesn't. Um, you're not held captive by it anymore. Yes, you're not in bondage with this anymore. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, part of that too is um, all of us have scars mm -hmm. from wounds we've experienced, and those things have healed, right? There's still a scar, but we don't have the ongoing wound. Yeah. Right. Yeah. People who are stuck in a past traumatic event or series of events haven't gotten to that place where they've experienced healing. So they need help experiencing healing. Um, and it's not that they're unwilling. They don't know how. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So what would you, like, what's the hope you give people? Because it's a journey. I mean, and, and that's the other thing we always want to remind. I think you already hit on it earlier, Kimberly. Like, it takes a process. It's, it's a, it's a re rewiring of what you're saturating on and what you're spending your time the again the lens of how you see yourself so what would you what's the hope you would leave someone with after listening to this that's struggling right now with with anxiety or ocd level anxiety history is not destiny one of the most powerful words anybody said to me history is not destiny our history does not define us it merely explains us mm -hmm. Okay, that was then, this is now, different version of you, different people involved, different situation, all kinds of different things. So it's not the same. We don't have to conflate them and make them the same thing, logically or emotionally. So being able to speak that truth in, into learning to practice speaking the truth into it, instead of getting caught up in the emotion that I'm feeling, you know, the emotion that I'm experiencing is a result of this being like that. And then I, and it's really easy now for me to believe they're the same and speaking that truth in. 
you know, uh, like I said, the foremost hope giving words anybody ever said to me when I was dealing with my own deep trauma was history is not destiny. And I can't even tell you how many times I've shared that with other people. Um, I, I've counseled thousands of trauma survivors, and that is something that they can, they will saturate on. It, my history is not my destiny. It's where I'm from. It's not who I am. It all comes back to what you're saturating on. What you saturate on is what you believe. What you believe is what you live. It's like our tagline, right? Right, exactly. It should be a bumper sticker. Uh, <laughs> and it's true. I mean, you, you saturate on something every day. You either the time, even when you're asleep. Yeah. Either you're saturating, saturating on something. So you're saturated on the truth. When I tell people that all the time, you want to be in control, you get to be in control of what your mind and heart saturate on all throughout the day. And I love, too, what you're saying, like, your history is not your destiny, because I think the anxiety is coming from the trauma of your history. Yeah. And so things didn't work out or you weren't safe. So that's how you that's like recreated in your mind. And to know that there's that hope of that you can you you can change it, you know. I asked one teenage girl one time, I said, who's the bossiest person in your life? And she told me, I said, have you ever said you're not the boss of me? Yeah. I said, you need to say that to anxiety. You tell anxiety, you're not the boss of me. And it cracked her up. But she started using that. You're not the boss of me. Yeah, you're not the boss of me. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Soul Care Podcast. We pray this has been a blessing and an encouragement for you. We want to leave you with four thoughts to reflect on. Is your identity in Christ or something else? How well do you understand the true nature and character of God? How much confidence do you have in who God is? And how does all of this impact what you are struggling with today? If you desire to learn more, check out the show notes for more resources and information. And please don't forget, you matter to God.